So without further ado, it's my pleasure and privilege to in invite the uh, economist that we've all been waiting for, the founder of Beacon Economics, Dr. Chris Thornburg. So welcome. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. that. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, a couple of things I realize, appreciate that uh, I'm, the, I'm the guy bringing you out today. That means it puts me in the unfortunate position of being between you and lunch. Um, the good news, I'm told, is at least I don't have to compete with Chick-fil-A. So I'm going to take that as an up. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today, and we've heard a lot of great information about the various real estate markets, and I don't have a lot of, of difference between what they said uh, what they said and what I'm going to say. Uh, what I can tell you, uh, of course, is uh, obviously I'm with Beacon Economics. We're an L.A.-based uh, 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 consulting firm, although we work across the nation. I've done a tremendous amount of work out here in the Inland Empire over the years, not the least of which is with my, my work with UC Riverside. Um, but uh, really, what I'm going to try to get across to you is, is the big picture. Where is the overall economy going? What's the, what, what are the <coughs> big driving forces you need to be thinking about um, when you're thinking about the high desert and what's happening up here? And on that basis, there's really a couple things we need to talk about. The first thing is, what do we think is happening in our economy? And then the second thing is, what is actually happening in our economy? Uh, and if you've been with me over my last few years uh, at this presentation or any of my presentations, you, you probably remember that these are not the same thing. They should be. What we think is happening should be what's happening and vice versa. But in fact, there's all sorts of reasons why these things do not align. And by the way, when you combine these two things, it helps you understand what's going on in the world in a lot of really powerful ways, as I believe. Uh, and when we put that together, it'll give us a little better sense of what's happening here in the Inland Empire. So let's start with the narrative. Last year, when I was with you, of course, the big narrative in our economy was about the recession that was about to befall our economy. We heard all about it, massive probabilities, all these forecasters told us the end was I. Um, if you were paying any attention, in 2023, turns out we didn't have a recession. Um, but what's interesting is, is, is not just that we avoided the recession, but look how the narrative shifted towards the end of the year. Because, it, you know, towards the end of the year, it became obvious the recession wasn't going to hit. Inflation started to slow down. Uh, we suddenly started hearing news about multiple Fed rate cuts. And all of a sudden, everything was great. Consumer confidence started leaping forward. The stock market took off. Bitcoin took off. And if you read a little deeper into the national press, uh, they will tell you that this magical turnaround was all due to the wonderful leadership of this man, Jerome Powell himself. And again, as noted, this is narrative and it is wrong, okay? It's not what happened over the course of the last year. And it reminds me of one of my favorite economists, a guy named John Kenneth Galbraith. He made a career in economics, by the way, pointing out that other economists weren't quite as smart as they thought they were. He famously said back in the day, the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. And right about now, I completely understand where this guy's coming from. I've never seen such nonsense. Now, we never bought in to this idea of a recession. We contribute to the Wall Street Journal survey of, of, of professional forecasters. Uh, the overall average was above 60%. We never got above 20%. By the way, they are now turning in our direction. It's funny, in January, that number dropped down to about 35%. There are still some curmudgeons out there who think we're still going to have a recession, but most of them are, are leaning against that right now. But, you know, they call economics the dismal science for a reason. Even if these guys, these folks are, are forced to back off and say, you know, it may, maybe it's not going to be a recession. They're not going to let you get away just that easy. The headline attached to the January release of this number, I just love this, it won't be a recession, it'll just feel like one. <laughs> it doesn't even mean anything. It's like, well, it's completely nonsensical, but this is the world we live in. Look, last year was not a year that we avoided a recession narrowly. Last year was a perfectly fine year for economic growth. Just buckle up for a couple seconds as I bounce all through this. Uh, overall growth last year, 2.5%. Growth across the board, good consumer spending, uptick in overall spending in non-residential structures, exports look good, business investment ticked up. It was a good year. Start with the consumer, as always. Americans did not survive a year of inflation and high rising interest rates. Americans are partying like crazy. 
There's no other way of putting it. Foreign travel at all-time record high levels. Restaurants spending 40% above where it was prior to the pandemic. Live Nation is printing money right now. There is not one concert there that isn't selling out, including every single VIP package. Have you noticed how every 77-year-old rocker is trying to strap himself into his old spandex to jump on stage to make a few extra bucks on his way out? And there's a reason this is going on, right? Uh, I have my, you know, it's like the return to the roaring 20s 100 years ago, a 20% increase in alcohol uh, consumption over the course of the last five years. The good news is at the beginning of the pandemic, we were getting drunk at home. Now we're getting drunk in restaurants. That's good. That's an uptick, right? Uh, gambling. Nevada has never been busier than it is right now. Uh, as for up here, very similar sort of picture. You know, I'm going to come back how there's been a shift to services, and you'll see that kind of flattening out taxable sales. But the numbers that are flattening out are still much higher than they were prior to the pandemic. You look up here in the high desert, you're talking about almost a 28% increase in overall spending. Uh, yes, it's cooled off, flattened out just a bit, but way above where we were before that. There's no sign of financial distress in our market. For all the stories about consumer credit, the reality is overall delinquency rates in consumer credit overall has never been lower than it is right now. We already heard there's almost no foreclosures out there. Bankruptcies are running about 100000 a quarter. That's the lowest we've ever seen. Americans seem to be doing great. Again, out here in the Atlanta Empire well. Wages continue to rise. You sure the population with a subprime credit score in San Bernardino remains near record low levels. Industrial production has been picking up. Labor markets remain tight. Unemployment rates are 3.8%, 3.9%. Job openings still elevated. Real earnings growth remains positive. We had 275,000 jobs in February. How about our fair state? I hear it's great for the nation, but we know things are terrible here. Well, of course, but how are they terrible? Well, according to one perspective, we are a socialist hellhole. People are fleeing the state. Businesses are feeling the state. Half the nation thinks that the ca California is failing right now. This is a survey from the LA Times. You read a little, a little deeper into this, I love this. It turns out over 60% of this sample had never been to California, but they know we're failing, damn it. <laughs> Now, of course, that's, that's the external view. We're a socialist hellhole. If you talk to people inside the state, turns out we're actually a capitalist hellhole, right? 30% of the people uh, living in poverty. Fast food workers desperately need to be, be protected from their rapacious employers. And, of course, every tenant needs to be protected from their evil landlord. Well, I am sorry. Which one is it? Are we a capitalist hellhole or a socialist hellhole? When somebody tell me we can't be both, this doesn't work. Now, whichever answer it is, uh, here's the answer. Well, here's the answer. Uh, neither one of them are right, right? We're neither of the above. These are both obviously extreme versions of what's going on in our state. Spending in our state is way above where it was pre-pandemic. Business applications remain high. GDP growth continues to be positive. If you compare California to the nation, now to pre-pandemic, basically we are growing a little bit faster than the nation overall in terms of output growth, job growth, per capita income growth, earnings growth. We're beating the nation. We are not falling behind. Now, we used to grow a lot faster than the nation, and that we are not doing anymore. But that's a completely different conversation having to do with housing, which I'll come back to in just a couple seconds. Overall, the only thing you can say is our unemployment rate has ticked up a bit. But before you get too excited about that, keep in mind that initial claims for unemployment insurance has a bunch of inch. Whoever these unemployed people are, I'm a little confused. I don't understand exactly why this number is going on. I still see a state that is dealing with labor shortages, not an excess supply of workers. And if you look out here in the Inland Empire, yet again, great numbers, 1.6% growth over the course of the last year, 6.3% above where you were prior to the pandemic. These are all very, very good data. In fact, the Inland Empire remains one of the fastest growing parts of the state's economy. Business investment is fine. Court proprietor incomes are up right now. And we just talked about the housing market. Couldn't agree more. Interesting market. We understand it is completely frozen. Why? Because mortgage rates went from 25 to 7.5%. And as a result of that, sales have absolutely collapsed. But put that to one side and take a look at prices. For all that increase in mortgage rates, home prices fell for about three months, hit bottom, and started growing again. And prices are now, yet again, at an all-time high level. So remember, when there is a collapse in market sales, that's one of two things that could be driving that. It's either a lack of demand or a lack of supply. 
when prices are going up, that means it's a lack of supply. What happened, of course, back in 2009 when prices were collapsing, that was a lack of demand. Completely different kind of situation. Out here, of course, almost no home sales. Very few people are selling because not a lot of people are willing to walk away from the 3% 30-year fixed rate mortgage. I, for one, can't blame them. But yet again, home prices continue to rise. You saw all that great data. You don't need to repeat it. By the way, it's a very similar picture in the commercial markets. Transactions have absolutely plummeted again very simple reason here. Interest rates are up. Valuations uh, are, are obviously changed, but there's not a lot of sales going on. Now, Wells Fargo is telling us things are going to look a little bit better, but honestly, what you have in commercial real estate was already stated. There's a gap. There's a problem. There's a pricing problem. The pricing problem has to do with the fact that the 10-year bond has gone up, but, but overall cap rates have not gone up with it. There's been cap rate compression, and as a result of the people who are thinking about buying these properties, well, they're kind of keeping the step stepping back. The real question is why aren't the sellers capitulating? Well, that has to do with the broader dynamics in our financial markets today. But just like with housing, it is interesting how things are shaking out, despite the fact that the resale market is relatively stalled, construction's actually up. Look how sharply non-residential has come up and total public spending is coming up as well. Good, solid numbers last year, particularly, of course, in manufacturing. Those are those chip plants, but also in commercial power and office. And the best news of all, coming into the la end of last year, inflation started to slow down, interest rates started to drop, we heard about multiple rate cuts, and of course, cue the party. Suddenly, consumer, consumer confidence is starting to come back up. The S&P 500 is leaping to an all-time high level. I'm not sure if you've seen this, Bitcoin, actually this is old, it's now above $70,000. Bitcoin is above $70,000. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but let's go through it quickly again. Is there a fundamental value to Bitcoin? Of course there is. It's zero. If you're wondering why, may I suggest a wonderful biography of an Italian-American gentleman by the name of Charles Ponzi. It's a wonderful rags to riches to jail story. By the way, speaking of rags to riches to jail story, we have a modern iteration of this. I might send him a copy of the book. might be good for him to read. And it all boils down to, of course, the problem here. The idea is that our social narratives and our economic realities are not aligned. And you see this happening all the time. And I've had to take this into account in everything I do in economics. And there's no better way to see the power of the narrative than in the positive value of Bitcoin. Why can't Bitcoin have positive value? For a very simple reason. Any kid with a master's degree in computer science can make another cryptocurrency. Ergo, none of them can be worth anything. But I can't argue with the number. It's there. The market's liquid. It's happening. What's going on? The power of the narrative, right? Power of the narrative. You have these crypto bros with their websites and their stories and their myths and their tales and their logic. Yes, all of it is kind of weird and broken. But, you know, when there's enough of that stuff and there's enough smoke out there, people start to believe. And in the middle of that belief, wham! comes real value, the power of the narrative. Now, it's easy to point at Gen Z and go, oh, those silly, foolish kids, they'll grow up someday. But you know what else is skyrocketing right now in value? Gold. Why? It's an inflation hedge. No, it's not. It's a metal. <laughs> and it's violently overpriced. Why is it violently overpriced? Because all these central banks carry thousands of pounds of it. And they just let it rot in their basements in form of these giant bars. Why? Well, you know, like 120 years ago, we used to use this as a basis of our commodity currency. Yeah, 120 years ago, we rode horses. What's your point? <laughs> Not the same thing. Okay, but we do it anyway. The power of the narrative that used to be important, ergo, it still has value today. Now, the other side of it is the unsustainable federal deficit. Now, you know the numbers, 1.8 trillion deficit, 120% debt to GDP, 100% if you get rid of the Fed holdings of it, as the case may be, but high. And then you have the issues of Social Security, Medicare. Uh, okay, you know about it, but is it really part of our social narrative? Let me ask you this question. Turns out this is an election year, you may have heard. And it's going to be a very ugly one. We know that, too. Now, when people walk into that voting booth in November and they're picking between a D or an R, do you think they're going to pick a D or R on the basis of which party has a better plan to deal with the deficit? No. And by the way, that's exactly why neither party has a plan to deal with the deficit. Why? We don't care, ergo they don't care. 
Now, by the way, that's dangerous because someday economic reality will rain on that parade. What happens then remains to be seen. Now, by the way, there is also the times that the stars align, where our social narratives and economic realities uh, align, and we are worried about the right stuff, but then it brings us to the third problem. What do you do about it? Best example of that, Ticketmaster. Complete thieves. They're totally ripping us off. We all know it. It's preposterous where they charge us. Narrative, reality. Yet for some reason, even though the Justice Department is filing some antitrust lawsuit against some company somewhere every single day, these guys never get it. Now, when you start thinking about the world in this way, it turns out it makes a lot of sense. You see narrative skewing <coughs> interpretation of our news. Narratives at the root of economic bubbles like Bitcoin. Narratives driving bad policy choices. Uh, Robert Schiller said it best. You have to think about narratives. If you don't think about narratives, you are missing something important. Now, mind you, it's all been said before. One of my favorite California philosophers, a guy named Will Rogers, said, it isn't what we don't know that gives us trouble. It's what we know that ain't so. What he's talking about is broken narratives. It's exactly what he's talking about. And of course, the most broken of narrative, the thing that lies behind all the chaos we've seen is miserabilism. This idea that no matter how good it is, there's somebody out there who's going to tell us how bad it is. And that has become just the way you do it, constantly hearing all sorts of bad news. And we saw that really start to warp policy when the pandemic hit. Now, the pandemic was a tragic human circumstance, but it was not a depression-causing event. Why anybody would say that out loud, well, I know why they said it out loud, that's how you get attention. You say it's the end is nigh, and suddenly some journalist will pick it up and put it in the paper. That's what they do. And so you had all these people running around saying this ridiculous stuff about a pandemic. No pandemic has ever caused a depression. Never happened. Why would they say this again? Well, yeah, that's how you get the attention. It's as simple as that. What was the pandemic? It was a giant blip. It was the deepest recession ever. It was the shortest recession ever. It ended in a year and a quarter completely. One quarter down, one year back. Contrast that to, of course, the Great Recession, which was six quarters down, seven years to recovery. That was a bad, bad business cycle. This was a giant blip. But don't let reality intrude on a good, of course, narrative. What happened? Our nation lost $1.2 trillion of income. In return for our troubles, we got $6 trillion of congressional stimulus. $5 of stimulus for every single dollar of lost income. And to give you a scale of that number, that adds up to $50,000 for every single American household. Unbelievable. Where'd they get the cash from? They didn't borrow it. You can't borrow that much money. They would have blown up the bond markets. They wandered down the street to the formerly independent institution known as the Federal Reserve. Uh, back in the day, I'd like to see Alan Greenspan would have told them no way, but they showed up. Jerome Powell, the ultimate patsy, said, what do you want? And they said, what do you got? How's five trillion? Great. Gives five trillion to the Congress. They fire hose it across the economy. They cause, of course, a 40% increase in the money supply. Why do we have inflation? May I point out the obvious, right? But no, they can't even still mention that. Now, the one good thing here is, 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 is this is not the 1970s. You can see in the 1970s, it was a decade of overexpanding the money supply. We got over it. This was a one-time hit. They're now fading away. They are engaged in quantitative tightening and shrinking the overall money supply. But all said and done, still a lot of money. What's important here is how that money has turned into wealth. You know, it's not just the cash on hand, but how it set off the financial markets. Five trillion hit those bank accounts. It went into the stock market. It went into cryptocurrency. It went into the stock, uh, 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 real estate markets, whatever. And that turned around and fed back even more wealth. Five trillion in brand new cash turned into $35 trillion of brand new wealth. And that 35 trillion is still sitting here. You know, if you were here last year, most everything I said to you was absolutely right, with one exception. I expected a little capitulation in the asset markets, and that didn't happen. Towards the end of the year, they took off again. And by the way, we're talking about a very progressive bubble. Look over here on the right-hand side. Younger folks, bigger increases in net worth than, than older folks. And by the way, people in lower net worth levels seeing a bigger increase in net worth than in higher net worth levels. Now look, there's always folks who have trouble out there. There is the one constant, there will always be people who are having a tough time. And you know, the idea that you can roll one person out having a tough time means everybody's having a tough time, that's broken narratives. Here's the key, 
Most people are doing better, and that is what's driving our economy. And when you have lots of demand, you have lots of money, that's a recipe for a huge surge in spending and a huge surge, of course, in prices. It's exactly what we got. People are, what are they spending money on? Air transportation, video audio equipment, by the way, that's phones, uh, alcoholic beverage, food and beverage, you know, none of the necessities, people again having a good time. Now, inflation has slowed down simply because prices have been catching up to the amount of money out there. This is how it works, and things are settling down, and people are going back to services. Take a look at the right-hand side. You can see restaurant spending continues to rise. Grocery spending has basically topped off. We're doing different things. We're walking a little bit away from goods. But don't confuse the shift towards services with a slowdown in demand. There's no slowdown in demand. Why? Because of all that wealth. $35 trillion more wealth today than five years ago. Much of that's still liquid. All households had a trillion dollars wealth prior to the pandemic. Now they're sitting on $4 trillion in wealth. And if you don't cash on hand, you can go ahead and use credit. Credit card debt is up 15% year over year. Well, isn't that a problem? Not really, at least not yet. Look, the press got all hot and bothered because credit card debt hit a trillion dollars the other day, right? I had some reporter, well, hey, why is this bad? Why is what bad? A credit card debt hit a trillion dollars. It's bad, right? Well, I don't know. Not really. Why? Well, it's a trillion dollars. Yeah, that's one more than, you know, $999 billion. What's your point? <laughs> well, they don't have a point. It's a number. They want to be scared about it. How about getting some context? Context is wonderful for reality. It turns out prior to the Great Recession, credit card debt was 8% of disposable income. Post-Great Recession was 5.5%. After the pandemic hit, it dropped below 4%, and now it's just about 5%. We don't have a credit card problem. We don't have a debt problem. Look at overall household debt servicing ratios on the right-hand side. Another bit of news. turns out the vast majority of, credit card, uh, of, of, of consumer debt is not credit cards. It's not student loans. It's mortgages. And the vast majority of those are 30-year fixed-rate mortgages. Ergo, the overall debt servicing ratio is staring there at an all-time low level. Now, I know this isn't what you heard. You heard people are getting crushed by debt. They're getting crushed by prices. I had a, a debate with somebody outside who said, well, you, yeah, you can't tell me that people aren't suffering. Gas prices are up 2 or $3. I said, stop right there. Two, three dollars? <laughs> I mean, we, we gas prices today are $5. Go back to 2009. You know what they were in 2009? $5. So, yeah, no, prices haven't gone up as much as we think. But, you know, we all love a good story. We all feel bad for ourselves. We love bad news, right? And so this stuff you see in the paper all the time. I love this. The narrative on inflation. 85% of Americans are feeling the impact of inflation on day-to-day -day lives, right? Look at the second bullet. 88% said inflation has impacted their spending at restaurants. Really? That means one of two things. That means either A, the 12% of people spend a lot of time in restaurants right now, because restaurant spending is up 40%, or it turns out what people are saying to the surveyor is their narrative, not the reality. And that's what it is. You know, one of the dangers of surveys that reporters never tell us, surveys don't capture reality. They capture narratives, and they are different. It's important, but whenever you see a survey result, understand you're seeing a narrative, not a reality. As soon as you mix the two, you are in dangerous grounds. Now, you also have these viral videos. Uh, this young lady says that, you know, boomers can't conceptualize. Uh, older generations don't know about inflation. They never had to fight for jobs. Really? <laughs> it's no wonder they want to get, make TikTok illegal. It's clearly bad for us. <laughs> but again, don't pick on Gen Z. Look at The Economist magazine, right? 150-year-old august institution of logical conversation about the economy, right? This is a recent article. Could the inflation nightmare soon be over? What nightmare? That I can't buy a boat because there's none available? What nightmare are we talking about? It's just bizarre. Look, inflation is caused by demand. Old expression, inflation is a consequence of too many dollars chasing too few goods, period. And when you're talking about gas prices going up, we had a big surge back in 2022. Gas prices went up by 50%, and the press immediately dove into it. Oh, my God, gas prices are up. People have a choice. They can feed their children or take a prescription drug. Ah, really? If it was that bad, what would people do? Gas prices are up. I can't afford. What do you do? You drive less, right? 
So how much less do we drive? Well, gasoline consumption went down by 1.5%. Okay, when prices go up by 50% and consumption goes down by 1%, that's not supply. That's demand. That's people saying, I can finally leave the house, and I'm going to damn well drive wherever I want, no matter how much it costs. And that's what they did. But again, how do they skew it? How do they shift the narrative? They walk up to this guy in the gas station. They put a camera in his face. Hey, man, how do you feel about filling up your tank? How do you feel about it? I love that. How do you feel about it? Well, I know how he feels. It's a completely loaded question. He's annoyed. He pulled into the gas station expecting to spend $100 to fill up his tank. Cost him $150. He's annoyed. That's called benchmarking. It doesn't matter if he's impoverished or a millionaire. He's annoyed. Asking that question, you're, you're deliberately skewing things to get the answer you want to hear. What should an honest reporter ask this guy? Not how do you feel about filling up your tank, but sir, where are you going? <laughs> you remember that boat I just bought? <laughs> Taking it down to the lake. You clearly don't care about the price of gas, do you? It's unbelievable. This is what we do. Here's a long run reality of things. Over the, in the last five years, we've seen about 3.2% inflation per year. A little above average, but really not that big of a deal. Back in 1979, it was 8.5% per year. That was inflation. Or by the way, if you live in Argentina, over the last five years, you're dealing with about 70% inflation per year. So can we have just a little bit of context before we engage in this national pity party? In fact, our problem in this nation is not high prices, it's a lack of people. Right now, even with the cooling off of labor markets, we still have one and a half job opens for everybody looking for a job. And it isn't because kids can't work or can't find a job or, or unskilled people can't find a place in this AI-dominated world. In fact, participation rates for 25 to 54-year-olds is at a 25-year high. People are working. The problem is there's not enough people. Why aren't there enough people? Well, look around. If you see any females, it's their fault. What is wrong with you? You're not having enough kids. Well, whatever the reason may be, birth rates are obviously way down, and that is part of the issue. We had the pandemic that got also part of it. But, you know, there's a simple solution to this. If you're not having enough kids, let some more people into the country. It's called immigration, right? And by the way, you can see immigration along the bottom there. Uh, immigration rates right now are a little less than 0.4%, not quite as high as they were in the 90s, a lot better than they were in the last couple of years. But by the way, just for the record, if you can't see those numbers, we're not being invaded by people from other countries. We have a normal level of immigration, as the case may be. And we need immigrants. There's no doubt about it. Look at our population pyramid. It's now a population column, and you can see that impacting labor force growth. If you can't grow your labor force, you can't grow your, your payrolls. If you can't grow your payrolls, it's tough to continue to expand businesses. So yeah, we have a fundamental issue. There's no doubt about it. What's interesting is how we are turning against immigration. Listen to the rhetoric of this election. All of a sudden, both parties are against it. Now, I get it. At some level, having people coming over the border, this isn't the way to do it. I don't think who can run across a desert is a viable immigration system. But with that being said, we need these folks. And we ought to be fixing our immigration system and making it work to backfill. But we're not. Instead, we're turning against these folks. And it's weird. But again, this is narrative versus reality. The narrative has gotten completely out of road. Now, there's some upsides to this situation. One, of course, is the labor shortage lead to higher incomes. Higher incomes for workers. Yes, real wages are rising. I already showed you. And more important, real wages are rising faster for lower skilled, lower paid workers than for higher skilled ones. That's great news. In fact, if you look at by quartile, the bottom 25%, 38% increase in the last eight years, 27% for the top. Now, with that being said, the downside is try to run a hotel, try to run a child care facility. Your labor costs are going up. We can see the tensions this is creating in our world. And as far as California goes, well, again, it's not a conversation of whether we have a, a, a socialist economy or a capitalist economy. It's a function of the fact that we don't grow our labor force. And if you want to know why, why, why Texas grows faster than we do, you look no farther than this graph on the right-hand side. They build housing. We don't. Ergo, they have labor force. We don't. This is the fundamental issue. Now, I understand people are now leaving the state of California. This isn't our new narrative. People are fleeing. 
what Ron DeSantis went on and on and on about, people fleeing the state of California. Now again, let's grab that operative word, flee. Okay, flee. If people are fleeing, I'm going to pick on the people in the front row here. If people are fleeing, what happens to housing vacancy rates? They go up, right? Exactly. Flee, vacancy rates up. Vacancy rates in California are at a record low level right now. We have a problem. Here's our problem. You know, it, 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 something's not wrong right with our narrative. Just look, there's no, uh, apartment vacancies are going up in the rest of the United States, not in California. There's still no homes to buy. What's going on? Here's the dirty little secret. We have, we have a declining population base. We have an increase in the number of households. Hmm. How does that work? It works by a big decline in people per household. Why do we have more, fewer people per household? Lots of different reasons. One of the reasons is changing demographics. We don't have enough housing. Housing becomes expensive. What does that mean? Well, families with kids move out. Families without kids, particularly young families with skills and income, they move in. They don't care, right? They want to live here. They want to live the dream. You got kids. You got to find a backyard. Right? So that's shifting it. But it's also a function of people just doing better. I showed you the income numbers. Lower income people, people who tend to be renters, are doing great. And what do you do when you're doing well? The first thing you do is you get your own damn place. Look, the three worst things you can live with are bed bugs, cockroaches, and anybody you're not related to or sleeping with. Okay? <laughs> Period. That's it. And so people are spreading out. But that's the key. There's always someone who isn't doing that well. And when everybody else is spreading out and you have a limited housing supply, someone must get pushed out. And they get pushed out through the price mechanism. Those high prices are telling us we don't have enough housing relative to supply. It is a supply issue over and over again. And if you think people are really suffering, take a look at California's poverty rate. The last four years, California has had the lowest poverty rate in history. It's doing fine. And by the way, this isn't coastal economies. You know, it's interesting. If you think about who's growing in this state, it's the Inland Empire. It's Fresno. It's, it's, it's Sacramento. It's the inland parts of the state where you have population growth. You have housing supply growth. And you have income growth. Take a look on the right-hand side. Take a look at these numbers. This is hotel and restaurant taxable sales, okay? This is local spending. It's not warehouses. This is people spending money locally. The biggest increases in hotel and restaurant taxable sales, Fresno, Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego. San Diego's tourism. The other three, that's people doing well. We do some work for the California Restaurant Association. They are closing restaurants along the coast, and they are opening them inland. There are full-service restaurants opening across the inland parts of the state because there's demand. What you're seeing is not a function of a population that is having troubles. It's a population that's doing great. But again, the people are out there telling the narrative. The PPIC used to do good research. Now look at the crap they're producing. A third of Californians are living in or near poverty. How, how did you come up with that? Well, we decided that the poverty line was $65,000. Oh, you could do that? You just make up your own number? That's neat. <laughs> so no matter what, you're just going to make it sound terrible for everybody. This is ridiculous. And, of course, we're responding to that by cranking up wages. We're not helping anybody. It's not Supply. It's not affordability, it's supply. And that's the one place they have truly failed. For all the smoke in Sacramento, they have not fixed housing supply. We're still producing 10,000 permits per year. Now, if you look at in the Inland Empire, this has been a rapidly growing place because of labor force growth, which is in turn because of housing supply. And that's true up here as well. You do have some of the spreading out. Take out people per household up here in the high desert. It isn't collapsing quite as much, but it is coming down. But you're building housing stock, population's growing, and that is one of your biggest assets as well. Unbelievable. Keep building housing is incredibly important. There's not enough housing out here. And yes, better numbers, but still not good enough in the Inland Empire, the Inland Empire has a history to be better than this. They need more, and you need to keep leaning in on this. As for commercial real estate, we saw a lot of good news. I don't have a lot of things to say about this except for one thing. I do want to talk about the increase in industrial vacancies. We heard about that. It is the real deal. And there are stories. Why here? And you might hear about, oh, our ports aren't quite doing as well as they are in Texas, or our labor costs are going up faster, which is true as well. Yeah, that may be a little bit of it. 
But ultimately, the real problem is the industrial space got ahead of itself. Look, commercial real estate has a tendency to do that. For a while there, and we were buying everything that was goods, and our supply chains were all screwed up, which meant that suppliers, or producers, were just desperately trying to keep up, and they were packing warehouses. Well, that's over. Things are going back to services. People are shifting back on spending on goods. Supply chains are clearing out, and lo and behold, warehouses are a little less demand. But this is just because we overdid it. What's going to happen, of course, is a little bit of excess supply, but eventually demand will catch up and it'll get going again. It's just a blip. Don't get too excited about it. The other thing you shouldn't get excited about is all this ridiculous rhetoric about interest rates coming down. Interest rates are not coming down because yet again of another bizarre narrative. The bizarre narrative on the part of the Fed. Why do we have inflation? It's not money supply. It has to do with some exogenous shock followed by expectations. By the way, inflation is terrible for American households, which is why he needs to fight off inflation, even if it hurts us. Right? I, I love this quote. We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there was a painless way to do it. There isn't. It's like he's almost disappointed he hasn't created a recession, right? Now, he's been loud and clear. We're not going to cut rates. We're still worried about inflation. He had to go on 60 Minutes and scream at the guys on 60 Minutes. We're not cutting rates. And I believe him. He, he probably won't cut rates. But you know what? Even if he did, it doesn't matter. What everybody in this room needs to be worried about from an interest rate perspective is mortgage rates and 10-year bond rates. Not the overnight rate between banks. There's only a limited amount of spillover there. Here's the key. Federal funds rate is flat. He's just leaving it at 5%, but they continue to do $90 billion a month in quantitative tightening. Quantitative tightening, by the way, is the opposite of quantitative easing. It's when they sell off some bonds, get paid for them, take that cash and flush it down, whatever the equivalent of the money toilet is in the middle of the Federal Reserve. They are shrinking the money supply, and with it, they're shrinking bank deposits. That's what's keeping credit markets tight. That's why bank loans are hard to get right now. It's as simple as that. So that means less supply of credit, and at the same time, more demand for credit because the federal government has a $1.8 trillion deficit, a deficit that's only going to get larger because their cost of carrying that, that debt is going up as well. So even when short rates start to come down, the only thing you can anticipate is an unwinding of the yield curve. Long run rates, higher, longer, we're all going to have to accept it. And by the way, we're okay. We're okay. One thing I want everybody in this room to keep in mind is interest rates are not high. They're only high compared to where they were over the last eight, nine years when they were bizarrely low. It's about time we get used to normal spreads within interest rates, but asset prices have to get back in line with equilibrium, and that will be the biggest issue. It's going to take a little while for those fundamental forces of supply and demand to re-equilibrate to get prices back to a, a normal point. So what does it all mean? Are we out of the woods? Are we out of the woods? Well, of course, I already noted, we are in the run-up to a nasty, nasty election, angry election. And it's interesting, you got two different answers. According to our current president, he will tell you, we're getting out of the woods, we see the light, we're making it, we're the comeback kids. And of course, Trump is like, oh, hell no, we're going straight in the middle of the woods, as deep as possible. And the answer is, they're both wrong. We are never in the woods. We were never there. The economy's fine. No one's suffering. Inflation is a function of excess demand. No more, no less. Real interest rates, those are painful. We have to adjust to those, but we're able to adjust to them for a couple reasons. First of all, tons of liquidity out there. Tons of liquidity. You know, one of the funniest things, I talked to a lot, a lot of commercial investors, and I always hear the same thing. Oh, man, we're sitting on piles of cash waiting for the deals, and they're not showing up. And I have to point out to them, when, every, when everybody's a vulture fund, nobody's a vulture fund. You see how that works? Everybody has cash. They could take their time. And the economy's strong. So as much as valuations are a problem, the front end of the house is doing fine. The net result of this is, of course, we are getting through the new interest rates. We'll get through it. And consumer demand remains strong. As for our first date, we're not collapsing. We missed the point. It's housing supply, not housing affordability. Why do we have a massive budget deficit? It's not the economy's fault. It's the fact that a couple of years ago when we had a $100 billion surplus, it wasn't a surplus. We got a whole bunch of tax revenues front-loaded because of the huge increase in asset prices. What we need to do is fix our revenue system, not raise taxes. Labor shortages, that's our big issue. If you really want to fix the state budget, may I suggest building a few more homes to let a few more taxpayers move into the state? That would help a lot. 
And if you're worried about people being able to afford more housing as opposed to up-paying them, how about upskilling them? Giving that woman working at the checkout line at McDonald's a couple bucks an hour is not nearly as helpful as training her in the skills necessary to become the assistant manager and then the manager at that McDonald's and maybe even someday owning that McDonald's as a franchisee. We're not helping people by raising the minimum wage. We help people and the economy by upskilling them to take the positions that are open. Now, there are basic economic reality checks out there. Obviously, we have these record def federal deficits. That's not sustainable. The Fed may moderate its stance, but not as much as much people think. Asset prices are ridiculously high. Bitcoin is worth zero, not $72,000. What happens here? That remains to be seen. Labor shortages across the United States constraining growth, but of course the scariest thing of all is miserableism. We live in one of the most prosperous periods of U.S. economic history you could possibly imagine, and I mean that for 95% of anybody. Yeah, we live better, not better than, than we did 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we also live better than most anybody else in the world. And yet, for some reason, we are an insanely pissed off nation. Okay, I got news. Yes, we're pissed off. Don't blame the economy. It's not the economy's fault. There's something going on in our national psyche, and we better get a grip on it. But as long as we keep thinking it's the economy's fault, we're never going to get out of this mess. Now, our forecast for 2024 are very simple. It's very much like you saw in 2023. Interest rates, basically the same. Growth, a little bit less. It's fine. That's not the story. This year, the story is this incredibly ugly election. And again, where this goes remains to be seen. Things are not that bad, but people can't seem to figure it out. Mark Twain said it best. It's easier to fool people than convince them they have been fooled. So with that being said, avoid the weapons of mass distraction. Keep your head down. The high desert has an amazing future in front of it. Keep building housing, bringing people up here. The place has enormous potential but that can, potential can only be reached if you get away from these ridiculous shrieking headlines that don't tell us what we really need to know. And with that being said, thank you very much for your time today. And if you want to get some of these slides, there is a QR code for you right there. You can get your phone out, take a picture of that. And with that being said, we'll turn it over to our gracious host. Thank you very much. Well, we ran a little over. Thank you for staying with us. Um, I want to thank again our sponsors. Uh, without them, this would not be possible. And our incredible team of staff and agents that worked tirelessly to get this done. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.